delighted and honored to be here today and have this opportunity to visit with you and to share with you. Uh, I always like to point out that I did serve 10 years in the Congress, but I left of my own choosing. I was not run out of town. You know, it's uh, one of the things we say about the United States Congress is that uh, the first two years that you're there, you spend wondering how in the world you got there. And the rest of the time, you spend wondering how the heck all that other crowd got there. But um, I've always said that I serve as a pretty good example of the fact that almost anyone can get elected to Congress. But there have been a few elections lately that replaced my position there, I'll have to tell you. Um, I want to speak to you a few minutes to just sort of give you my thoughts on these challenging times uh, in which you gather here and in which we uh, go about our agendas today. But before I do that, I want to go back just a minute. Herb and I were talking yesterday, or day before yesterday, when I was planning to come down here, and he and I both agreed that it's sort of amazing when you go back to think about the environmental movement, uh, how recent it is. Uh, it was not until well into the last century that I even knew what the word ecology meant and before it was even talked about. And much of what happened, the great environmentalists who began to move things forward, of course, Teddy Roosevelt had begun his efforts around the turn of the century when he felt that so much of America's wild area and its wilderness and wildlife was being lost and be ex being exploited. And Muir and others came along behind him, Aldo Leopold. Uh, and then, of course, later in that century, Rachel Carson wrote her book, uh, Silent Spring, which really began to make people think. And other books like Extension by Paul Ehrlich and books like this that I read began to have their impact on the psychic, but it was a long time before we really began to get the environmental movement going. It was not until we began to see things like major rivers in our country that literally caught fire and burned because of the industrial effluent that had gathered in these waters that we really got serious about it. We found the traces of DDT in the eggshells of eagles on the Alaskan coast and traced it all the way back and there was that wonderful metaphor that Aldo Leopold put in the Sand County Almanac. And listen closely, he talked about Adam X, which was the atom of a limestone fragment that was dislodged by a seed that grew up in the limestone crevice and Adam X was freed. And it washed out down the hillside and grew up in a mountain flower that was munched by a mouse and then deposited by way of a mousing owl down on the plains below where it grew up in the prairie grass, was munched by a buffalo, deposited by a stream where it washed into the belly of a brook trout, and then was deposited in the waters off the Alaskan coast by a migrating eagle. And these kind of passages began to make people think uh, and to see things differently than we had. Until that time, major efforts were those set aside, really to just set aside and conserve things like Roosevelt's work. But in large, the consciousness of the American public, in my opinion, began to be moved by constituencies who had a passion for America's wildlife. It was the animals themselves. Of course, we love forests and prairies, and we did much to change them. But when things like the passage of the buffalo and the passenger pigeon, and then our depletion of many of the herd animals and the plume hunters of the turn of the century began to take their impact, Americans began to wake up. And so those attitudes began to change, but remember how recent. Well, let me tell you, it's also a time when America, this period was, was rising to the heights of economic might and influence in the world. And, was, and it is the case with most all developing countries. America's wealth was derived from the utilization and unfortunately often the exploitation and monetization of its abundant natural resources. Its productive lands, its seemingly limitless forest resources, its minerals and its abundant waters. 
But at this same time, I will always believe that at the heart of that movement, that we're beginning to change the politics and consequently the management and utilization of these resources was a significant impact that the degradation and mismanagement of the resources was beginning to have on the communities of wildlife with which the country had been so generously blessed. Slowly but surely, a, a land and wildlife ethic was beginning to develop that would play a major role in the protection and enhancing much of the natural environment that exists today. And America's outdoor community, some hunters, some fishermen, some hikers, but that constituency began to change the course of things. And that's a major point that I want to touch on you today. And that is that any issue, regardless of what it is, must have a constituency. In democratic countries, the process will simply not promote a government's action on meaningful concerns unless there is a constituency that supports the cause, whatever it might be. Democratic governments react to the needs and concerns of the people when they are expressed through the voices of proactive constituencies. So as you move along, you want a crowd with you. There's an old saying that if you look around and there's no one with you, you're just out for a walk. These are challenging times, and I want to comment a moment or two before I move on. In challenging times of economic difficulty, it's been my experience that though unfortunate and short-sighted as it may be, our concerns and those of governments in particular turn to what is mistakenly more pressing and of immediate concern. America today is not alone in its financial difficulties that are the headline news of today. This concern is shaping the political scene in our country, and it is causing a major debate on how to get control of the burgeoning debt that many feel is threatening not only America's economic prosperity at home, but its influence in the world arena. This is not limited to the U.S. There are global concerns with world economic conditions that are having their impact on agreements on environmental concerns between nations and continents. In my opinion, it is going to be increasingly difficult to find the same financial support from federal and state governments for environmental programs unless we can demonstrate clearly that they are not only cost effective, but they literally add monetarily to the economy. Now, in the long term, I have no doubt personally that they do, and as I'm sure most of us gathered here today believe. But those constituencies that I spoke of earlier must feel as strongly as you and I, and it is our job to bring them in behind us. As much as I believe we should not leave our future generations saddled with the debts of our generation, I also believe it is wrong for us to leave them with a diminished asset ledger where the natural resources that we've inherited have been depleted or diminished or mismanaged. But the challenge is, and it's always has been, to demonstrate that the value of these resources in both a cultural and a monetary sense exists. And those of us who care for the natural world must be better, and we must be more precise and professional in our efforts in that regard. Now, I know that I don't have to remind the audience of the issues of terrorism and global spread of drugs and the steadily increasing world demand for energy all of which are reaching proportions that displace so many other concerns, such as those for our natural environment. But we are literally in competition with this current world scene. Indeed, you're together here today in challenging times to the causes and the concerns to which you have all committed yourselves so deeply. Well, what really is my message to you today? I'm not a trained scientist or a biologist but I don't need to be. You are all specialists in your fields, and you know the issues in the science. I'm sure that if this group right here were tasked with sitting down and drafting a plan for total cooperation on the migratory species of the Western Hemisphere, that the talent and the expertise is adequate in this room to do just that. But my friends, policy is not drafted in a vacuum. 
It is dependent on far-ranging considerations that comprise a process that in the United States Congress is described like this. We compare it to the making of sausage, which as we all know is made up of some rather strange parts of the animal that is being utilized. In the Congress we say that the making of a law or setting of a policy is like making the sausage. The end process usually turns out pretty well, but you might not want enjoy watching it being made. Or for that matter, you might not want to know what all the ingredients were. Well, let me give you my opinion of some things that we might consider as we come to this effort to reach agreement on how to best cooperate on the protection of those wonderful species that we share here in the Western Hemisphere. First, on environmental debates and issues, and to those of us who are trying to carry this out, this is not a card game. It is not poker, where the object is to win the whole game and take all of the stakes. It is about reaching consensus. It is about coming to the best agreement that we can come to so that we can begin to make progress on our concerns. It is about conflict resolution, where we reach across the bargaining table and we sincerely attempt to understand the concerns and the different needs of the various negotiators and their constituencies. No matter how strongly we believe in our own conviction in this process, we must remember that our choice is most often to either reach a consensus or to leave the bargaining table without accomplishing anything. So let us imagine that we're gathered at the table. What is the first thing we should do as we begin to make the sausage? The first thing, in my opinion, is we put the facts on the table. We start with the science, the empirical data. Each of us must face the empirical facts head on and either decide to go off on theory and down some cold trail or work on what is established. The very first environmental issue that I inherited as a freshman member of the Congress was what we would call in our country a real grizzly bear, a man-eater. The installation of a tide gate on the Savannah River was suspicion to be the culprit. And I want to try to draw you the clear picture of this. What was happening was that this tide gate was installed to force all of the water from the incoming tide to return to the sea down the main channel of the river. The gate was installed on the backside of an island in the middle of the river that divided it into two channels. You see, by causing all of the flow to front, flow down the front river, the velocity of the flow was increased and it was reviewed as a money saver because that scoured the sediment which annually had to be drained in an alluvium river like this. The issue though and the problem was that by closing the tide gate, more salt water was being forced into the federal wildlife refuge that lay adjacent to the back channel. 25,000 acres of freshwater tidally influenced wetlands, the most productive that we know of, and almost a third of what will exist today on the eastern coast. This greatly diminished the value of the wetlands for migratory waterfowl changing from hyacinth and bulrush to spartana flora and cordgrass. Well, I got all of the stakeholders together, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, famous for its work in wetland areas. The Ports Authority, since the river is a major industrial river and port, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Historical Society, because it's a historic place of great history, and then the Nature Conservancy to represent the public constituency. We agreed to fund a study at the University of Florida utilizing the French Landsat satellite telemetry and then we put the facts on the table. The study was conclusive and it showed quadrant by quadrant, three feet by three feet, the changing biology that was occurring as a result of the operation of the tide gate as it forced more salt water into the refuge. The findings were irrefutable and the tide gate was deactivated. 
The Corps of Engineers requested additional funding to handle the settlement problem within the channel based on the fact that they were damaging federal property. And the refuge has today gone back to its highly productive freshwater influenced biology and the migratory waterfowl refuge is secure. What did it? It was the science. It was the irrefutable empirical data that brought the resolution about. And when it can be attained, it is the strongest of all places to start from. Secondly, let me make an assessment. I will wager you that there are some issues that might be beyond the possibility of resolution when we consider the great diversity constituted in this organization known as WIMSI. But I hasten to add to you, there are far more areas where consensus can be reached than those where it is not possible. There's far more to work on than you could reasonably hope to achieve. And so don't let the difficult ones slow you down on the ones that are less attainable. I think it is far more important to make some progress than no progress at all. Progress breeds additional progress and it becomes a sort of incubator for additional opportunities in progress. The old adage is universal that success has many allies and failure is an orphan. An orphan. There's another apparent risk in a failure to reach consensus. <clears throat> Times and conditions worldwide and nationally are constantly changing. And I want to give you a classic example. In the late 70s, the cartel, the oil cartel, raised the price of oil so dramatically and reduced production so that America was thrown into a terribly precarious situation. It was a main cause of an economic recession that carried very serious economic and social and geopolitical implications for our country. A debate arose at that time regarding America's need to search for oil in all of the best places at home. And all information pointed to an area called the 1002 area of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in the northeast corner of Alaska, 19 million acres in total. Serious wildlife concerns, but also compelling geological evidence that pointed to the possibility of a major field beneath the surface. A major field that could contain as much as 5 or 10 or 15 billion barrels of oil an incredible amount of oil and an incredible wealth. I was a new member of the Fish and Wildlife Subcommittee on Merchant Marine and Fisheries, and our committee and subcommittee had purview over the federal wildlife refuges. I was sent along with committee chief counsel to give our committee chairman our opinion of what the committee should be recommended, and I spent three summers up there trekking back into and reading and learning everything I could. Our chairman had asked me one day, I understand you like wild places. And I responded to him that I did. Our conclusion came to this recommendation. We suggested that we put down four test wells under winter conditions when the tundra is frozen as hard as cement and you never leave your sign. At that time, most of the wildlife has departed. The porcupine caribou herd has gone back south and the snow geese have departed for the south. We attached very stringent environmental requirements on the wells and stipulated that only the oil companies participating in the test well process would have a chance to compete for exploration if it were later approved by Congress. Now follow me closely on this. The info from the test wells would have been put before the National Science Foundation and a special panel of experts would review it as well. If the results pointed to a high possibility of a major field, then the review committees would submit their findings to the Congress if it augmented the geologic evidence. And then the Congress would then vote as to whether or not to open this limited 2,000 acres out of 19 million for exploration and development. We tied much of the royalties that would be generated to new environmental issues and to other environmental needs in Alaska and set up funds for mitigation and damage. <clears throat> and damage. The results, both the environmentalists and the oil companies hated our bill. And it's when I knew we were probably pretty close to being right. Unfortunately, what happened 
Oil prices declined. The cartel waved on its cohesion. And so the debate was never held. Today, the energy crisis in America has only gotten worse. The economy is more challenging, and the cost of oil rises steadily, along with the increasingly dangerous geopolitical environment in that part of the world that produces much of the oil, the 7.6 billion barrels a year that the United States utilizes. The debate never got to a point of whether or not the oil, if it were there, could be safely extracted and the wildlife protected, it never occurred. It was a debate over policy, a standoff, and precedents, and polarized constituencies, most of whom had never read the 1002 report, didn't know what it said, and almost all of whom had never visited Anwar. My point to you is this, that the political and economic environment for a more pragmatic approach to the question of whether or not exploration is allowed in the most promising place of the North American continent for a major field has now totally changed. The failure to reach a consensus has left an environment where the economic and political situation could very possibly, in a new debate, and if things worsen, lead to exploitation without strong environmental restrictions. And as well, the entire matter might have been settled if the test well results didn't substantiate the geological evidence of a major field. So we opted for doing nothing. And times have changed as they will imperably in the future. Well, I've covered a lot of ground. I want to conclude my remarks to you today by leaving you with a list of conclusions that comes from over a quarter of a century in being involved in the policy process in our country but also what comes from 67 years of my life's experience and observations. My love for and concern for our natural world is a part of my deepest and most abiding convictions. And I share these thoughts with you in the sincere hope that they might be of help to you in your effort. First, share your wonderful storehouse of information freely and openly with your counterparts. You can't get anywhere if you don't do this. Separate yourselves from personal dogma that prevents yourself from understanding your counterparts' concerns or that prevents you from broadening your own capacity to learn. That's what learning is all about. I see brilliant people who never learn anything because they never understand how to step into the debate and put themselves in the other people's shoes. In spite of how cynical the debate becomes, you simply have to have confidence in the fact that empirical information and intellectual discourse can move the debate in the right direction. It will in the end. Look always for consensus. Let the politicians have the debates on the unattainable and build on even small successes and agreements. Agree to revisit the issue, and that's called adaptive management, and it works well. Make a start, and then come back and review the results and work for further progress. You can call it taking small steps or describe it as you'd like, but take something away from every issue that you enjoin. Now, I know that some part of what I'm saying to you sounds a bit old-fashioned, and simplistic, and maybe out of date. But I'm very sincere when I tell you, my friends, that I've seen possible agreements of the highest importance sabotaged by obtuse and callous conduct of supposedly intelligent people. Some people come to the bargaining table intent on braying like a jackass, and they do more damage just with their attitude than they do with their obstinance. Be judicious with your personal intelligence and your knowledge. Use it to bring out all of the information you can possibly gather from your counterparts because it is only through getting everyone to participate that consensus can be reached and progress made. Intimidation by the person who attempts it and uses it 
cuts off the flow of spontaneity, and it reduces the chance of success. If you intimidate someone, let me assure you, you've most likely lost their vote. Above all, probably the most important thing in all discourse, build trust. You get nothing for people who mistrust you. I don't care how smart or how impressive or how much you know, if your audience or your counterpart mistrust you, you're just out for a walk. <laughs> These are difficult times, but most importantly to this group gathered here today, I believe there are truly critical times to our natural resources and to our environment. We can no longer look to government for all of the solutions and all of the funding but we can work with our governments as long as we build constituencies that support and follow us, and as long as we bring a trusted source of information and concern to the debate. There was a time when we had the luxury of just relying on nature's wonderful resiliency and ability to heal herself so that she could mitigate our mistakes. Today, we do not have the margins for error that we once had. We are no longer just burning up the fat and the fluff. We are down to the meat and the bone of our natural resources. And rather than stand on dogmatic convictions, we must find the areas where we can reach consensus and rely on those agreements to make our case for future progress. These successes small as they might be, become models. And let me assure you from one who's been in the policy arena for 30 years, there is nothing more effective than a working, successful model to take to the policy arena. Well, I truly hope that my comments prove to be of some value to you in the future. It's been a distinct honor to visit with you today. <clears throat> Congressman Thomas has agreed to answer any questions. Are there any questions or comments on his remarks? Yes. Hi, I'm Richard Huber from the Organization of American States. Thank you very much for the profound and thought-provoking presentation. Um, I was particularly impressed how you continued talking through the fire alarm. I tend to get terribly distracted <laughs> on, on much lesser things. Uh, it reminds me, as a teenager, uh, you sourced the Sand County Almanac by Aldo Leopold, and it made me think. I don't know if everyone in this room has read that book, but certainly, I'm not sure it's in Spanish, but certainly it's really an excellent book, and I think I'm going to go back and get it and read it again. I read it as a biology student uh, in high school. But my question to you, and this may be a bit unfair, but I, I, the whole global warming debate, You've watched it. You were involved with it. You talk about good imperial ev um, evidence. You know the story there, the, the WikiLeaks type of thing about you know, bad empirical evidence or, or, or scientists changing. But you know, obviously, this is deeply important to everyone in this room. I made a reference to the fact that in a Caribbean island today, uh, let's use St. Lucia as an example, and the St. Lucia representative is here. They had the driest droughts over the summer on record and the, and the rainiest rains. Uh, now, obviously, a hurricane had something to do with that, but in one year, they've had the two extremes, which is what they're saying will begin to happen more. It's not happening overnight. It's over 30 years. It's 100 years. Anyway, more on the, on the whole political, the, the way the whole global warming debate, the Stern Report, Al Gore, I mean, obviously something went wrong because most Americans in a recent survey have more disbelief about global warming than they did five years ago. So we obviously blew it as environmentalists on raising the consciousness and getting the sort of policy initiatives that we hoped would, would have an impact on global warming. You, I thought you might like to just... Well, my that. first, and I've watched all of this debate, of course, as best I can. Uh, my first assumption is that you come to that big table to try to deal with something 
as monstrous as global warming. Uh, I would just have to say to you that all of the stars would have to line up perfectly. The environment would have to be right. You'd have to have the best empirical data. It would have to be a total, uh, a total KO of your opponents. That, of course, disturbs me, and I would rather see us come to those agreements quickly. But my point to you would be that in something as vast and expansive as this is, we're going to have to look for starting points. We're going to have to look for models that we can find. Now, I am not a scientist, and I don't know within that great sphere of global warming what that might be, but you, you are. And so you've got to find, this, this, it's, it's small steps. Uh, the, the comment that I made a while ago, and I, I truly believe this, every time in my life since following, following policy, I, I use a little expression, and I might have to explain, but when the economy goes in the tank, the environment is the first thing, environmental concerns go in the tank with it. Uh, Herb and I even talked about in the recent finding of the deficit commission that reported to the Congress on what to do about America's fiscal crisis. And we might as well be honest, that's exactly what it is. We're facing a terrible fiscal crisis that incidentally has cut across party lines and the public is on to. It shaped this election, it's going to shape elections for the future. But in that case, they literally pointed to the fact one thing, they said, you know, we're going to, put, we're going to have a crowd that's, that's for uh, finding out what is profitable and make cuts. We're going to form a committee. And one of the two or three things they mentioned uh, was, and this is pertinent to the United States, but it's exemplary, uh, is to cut back on expenditures for invasive species. And being a landowner and a farmer as myself, I see it all the time. Uh, and I know it's terribly costly for me. It's costly. For, we're having to spend tremendous amounts of money on something that, that's taken, that could have been more wisely spent elsewhere. So I just have to tell you, I don't hold a lot of hope in the very near future. I don't see where, and I have to tell you, our government and most democratic governments, as you know, respond to emergency and catastrophe. If you don't have some sort of a building catastrophe, how do you know, you know, how do you build a public uh, sentiment out there for doing something about it? And it's why environmental work is this longer, more slowly education, building constituencies, down all the way into what we refer to as the grassroots. That's the individual level down in the communities. So Richard, I don't, I don't have an answer for you there. I don't think that it was because the issue wasn't wasn't clearly stated or clearly framed. I think it was all of those external things that I mentioned a while ago that influenced policy making. It's never done in a vacuum. As it gets worse, and as the results become more clear and evident, it will be revisited. I can only hope that we don't, as I pointed out earlier, get into the literal meat and the bone of things before it's too late. Democracies seem to careen from one ditch to the other. They can never get in the middle of the road and proceed with pragmatic results. And that's just, I guess, as much our own human nature as it is to the political process. But we, I just watched it too long. I, we, 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 we govern. Uh, there's good work that goes on. You all are doing tremendously good work here. And I don't mean to be cynical about this. I say that the two greatest sins of old age are cynicism and sentimentality, and I guard against it because I'm 67. I'm not cynical, but I'm realistic. And it's why I go back to the best that I know to do with what little time I have and what I can share. Find some good working models and concentrate on those. And the big ones are just gonna have to have time to ripen. Okay, uh, <clears throat> Doyle from St. Vincent. I want to say first, that is an excellent presentation. I want to also acknowledge that not only St. Lucia has the problem, St. Vincent and the Grenadines as well, where we have a very, very dry spell 
followed by a lot of rain and hurricane and so on. Now, what I have seen, programs like these, most of the time the Ministry of Health are being left out and they concentrate mainly on one aspect of the environment. Well, what I'm, what I'm here to do is to observe. And my observation show me throughout the years that the human race is exchanging places with the wildlife. And we destroy the natural habitat by going and we destroy the mangrove. They utilize that habitat for their food and resting place and nesting. Eventually, they leave their natural habitat because human beings take over. They build massive hotels and other development. And now these wildlife and other creatures, they come into the community because they have no, else with, no other place to go. So they come searching for food in the community and they will eat whatever they, they see. So they eat even human. We disrupt their natural habitat and some of these things we are paying for now. Okay, I think um, there should be more legislation deals with uh, zoning, even in the developed and developing countries where we start utilizing our land resources properly so we can have what you call greater impact in our um, resource distribution. So we can do our conservation and we can have protective areas. We need more of that so that we can protect the natural habitat of these uh, creatures. They are useful, they are part of the ecology, and when we destroy these things, we can see things like the avian influenza, because man and wildlife start sharing the same community, and uh, we have to be careful. I know the policymakers; they are trying. I think they start a bit too late. I think all of us, the Ministry of Health, the environment, all of us should take, take the warning seriously and see how we can start mitigating against these impacts. I am very happy to be here and uh, maybe my first time understanding these kind of programs because the Ministry of Health will never involve in these planning of such programs, but I am seeing how important it is because as we destroy the environment, the ministry resources are depleting because we have to fix it and it becomes less, less uh, manageable. Okay, I even, even I might say that the, 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 the natural wildlife that used to help us as predators, okay, we see the mosquito population increases and a lot of things because the natural predators are destroyed. And we can go on and go on and go on. So it, the time has come where we must tie the Ministry of Health into some of these environmental programs because when you, from the environment, fail, we try to correct it. And sometimes we are being reactive rather than proactive. So planning of these programs, more health personnel should be on an, an target. Okay, that is my contribution. Well, I'm, I will have to tell you, I, I couldn't hear everything, but I certainly think I understand exactly what you're saying. Let me, let me just make a few brief comments. And I might say some things here that I, I'm sure I will, probably already have, that some of you disagree with. There's great diversity in this room. But again, I go back to my thing of constituencies and where you find support for what you're doing. Um, there is much value in the natural wildlife and resource that we have. And it is not exploited when you protect it and develop it so that it becomes of economic value to you. Uh, the hundreds of millions of dollars that are spent in Africa, not just on hunting safaris, but on photographic safaris, uh, 
bird watching, ecotourism, as it's referred to, is terribly popular. And there's no doubt that there is a far greater monetary value here than is being utilized, particularly in countries that are at a different stage of development. It's true even in the United States, where you have some of the terribly powerful organizations there that are doing, and follow me closely so you don't misunderstand me, they represent sportsmen, uh, the Wild Turkey Federation. The Wild Turkey in America was all but gone, and they've been totally restocked, and they're in every state and every county that you can imagine today. And that interest was because of the hunters who took an interest and helped raise the money and formed the organization that became their advocates. The same with the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. Vast acreages of those lands, very important to the elk because they migrate from higher to lower grounds, that the elk is being reestablished in great parts. Even the wolf has been brought back. There's a controversy around the wolf that, that is going to have to be debated, and we have got to figure out how to manage it. The truth in the end, as you know, we're the stewards of all of these resources. You and I can go home and we can do different things, but the animals are out there and they're going to be there. And we're the ones that determine what their future is going to be. So wildlife resource, the, the group that I'm involved with called the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation, is just as adequately concerned about the preservation of the wildlife habitat and the wise management of the wildlife resources as we are about the rights of the people who hunt and fish because they go, they're compatible. So yes, I think if I've heard you right, and it's what my contention is, there is a tremendous value out there uh, that can be utilized without exploitation of the resource. And the truth is that our wildlife is nothing in the world more than the indicators of how we manage our environment and how we manage our resources. And, and it's, it's like the canary in the coal mine. Uh, they tell us whether we're doing it right or not. You know, I want to, I'm going on to Alabama to meet with a group and make a talk. We do a lot of things that, we, that aren't intentional. I grew up in the South where the longleaf pine forest comprised about 98 million acres of the, and was still in a second regeneration after it was cut over around the turn of the century. It was highly diverse, uh, uh, the most diverse forest that we had in America. 90-something species of, of plants and animals out there, many of them listed today uh, and protected. There were 98 million acres. There might be 3 million acres of it left today. Now, we didn't intentionally go in there to destroy the wildlife, but the, ec the ec economies drove us to replace with when the pulp and paper industry came south to produce cellulose from the forest. And the long leaf didn't lend itself to that. Today we're in an educational state, and I'm one who's restoring longleaf pine forest on my lands, which are not extensive, but a pretty big farm where we've gone back to, to, to longleaf. And I'm making a model out of it so others can see that there is a different model to this thing of converting and changing. All of this is, is a tremendous educational process, and it is a sharing process. And it's why our credibility and trust, going back to that factor, from those of us who endeavor in this area, is so critical. Uh, I, I'm a consultant. I'm registered as a lobbyist by law, but I don't lobby. But I can tell you the first time that I walk into a policymaker's arena and sit down and sell him something that's not true and give them information that is not accurate is the end of my relationship with that policymaker. So our trust, our small models that I've talked about, I just, I think it's so essential. Models are what people see and relate to more than anything else. And if you can show this little progress, it is going to lead to more progress. And, and as I say, we're on a cutting edge here. I, um, I meant what I said. I think that we don't have the luxury of making a lot of mistakes from here on out. Uh, we're down to the meat and the bone of our resources. So. I hope I've, you know, maybe just reflected a bit on what you said, and I salute you, and, and I, uh, I think that there's nothing that is more important to us than, than understanding this natural world that we've inherited and see that the next generations have a chance to do the same. 
If nothing else, if, not, if there's not an easy one here. <laughs> well, thank you. I salute your work here. I wish you the best. Was there... Okay. Thank you again. Thank you, Congressman Thomas, for that very thought-provoking um, presentation. Um, we're still running a little bit ahead of schedule, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to switch um, an item that was going to be done this afternoon um, in this hour. Uh, about, we have about 45 minutes before lunch, um, and that is the WMC Purpose and Organization um, discussion led by her Raphael. Thank you, Marina, and thank you, Congressman Thomas, for that uh, very uh, stimulating and enlightening uh, presentation. And in fact, um, a number of the points raised by Congressman Thomas fit perfectly into the discussion that we're going to enter into now uh, with regard to the, um, the terms of reference or the, uh, the uh, purpose and organization document. And I'll, I'll touch on some of them now and we'll get back to them as we go through the document. I had indicated earlier this morning uh, that, we, since that, we, that we would discuss this this afternoon, but since we have time, it's better that we address it sooner than later. And since you have not, those of you that are new and not familiar with the document and have not had time to look it over, uh, we will use a few moments now to go through it at least uh, generally so that everybody has a sense of just what it is where uh, is in this document. What I find so interesting is in Congressman uh, uh, Thomas's uh, presentation, uh, the frequent reference of consensus, how important consensus is. And as we get to how this document gets implemented, that's one of the fundamental